Hi, it's Richard and Craig here with our yeah. week four feedback video. Yeah. We've got 11,137 learners, Craig, so far, sharing some really interesting stuff. I mean, mm. values, ethics, and goals. I guess it's the it's the, it's the small talk, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the unimportant stuff around mindfulness. Well, that's right. I mean, when you sort of go more deeply into it, of course, a whole lot of other questions open up, which is great. Some fantastic dialogue, clearly, this week on the discussion boards. Definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of our learners can really start to make the link between mindfulness and values, ethics and goals and, and, and see the application of it in their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because mindfulness in its current form has been secularised and decontextualised mm -hmm. from different wisdom traditions, which is very useful because it makes it much more widely accessible. Mm -hmm. But I guess, in, in a way, sometimes it's, it, you know, the, the comments made that to, to take it out of its wisdom traditions means perhaps we've decontextualised it from why we're doing it and, and, and the whole point of it. And so mm. I think it's really promising and really it's, it's really great to see that once people start to practice mindfulness, they just often become more aware of their, their values and the way that mm. they're showing up in the world and often just leads to more ethical behaviour. Yes. And look, it's not necessarily inappropriate that uh, when somebody engages with mindfulness, it's initially to help them to manage their stress or to get a night's sleep and so on, because that's useful and that's helpful. Definitely. And, um, you know, somebody, you know, uh, oh, I, I need something to help me to focus better or deal with academic stress or something. Well, you're going to have to take on a whole ethical, <laughs> you know, to be um, a great disincentive for people yes. to engage with it. But I think we engage where we are. And then as time goes on and we become more reflective, then maybe it opens up deeper questions. And then that's perhaps when we go into it. Yeah. 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 Can it numb the mind, Craig, so that we don't have to ask difficult questions? <laughs> well, look, if it's numbing the mind, that's not mindfulness. I think uh, sometimes people use what they think is mindfulness as a way of avoidance. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's an important question or issue that's, that's looming in the mind that comes to mind. And it's coming to mind not because it's a distraction, but because it needs attention. And uh, trying to practice what we're thinking of mindfulness as, uh, as a form of avoiding engaging with that is, um, that's avoidance, that's not mindfulness. And um, that might be mind numbing because we're not paying attention to what really is yeah. important at that moment. And yeah, a bit of a trap, isn't it? Even just focusing on the breath rather than focusing on that unpleasant emotion can be a bit of a trap sometimes, which I think is why some of the exercises that we've included in this particular mm. course you know, really bringing compassion and, and cultivating friendliness, that they get us in touch with stuff that we might have been avoiding, which I think is sometimes why it's quite a challenging thing to do and why this is, yeah. of course, designed as the advanced course. And there's a very subtle difference when sitting down, practicing meditation, maybe using the breath, and it's like um, something uncomfortable comes in and it's, oh, quick, the breath, the breath. Yeah, and, yeah, and I don't want to feel that, I don't want to think that. And there's a kind of reactive kind of avoidance as a, a desire to suppress or get rid of the experience rather than, um, just it's space for it being in the awareness that that feeling or thought is there and it's just like there's an acknowledgement, like a gentle acknowledgement, but without a, a sense of having to fixate on it. But when we get out of the chair and into our day-to-day -day life and that thought comes to mind, oh, time to do the tax return. <laughs> if it really is time to do the tax return, that might need attention or yeah. it's, look, need to call that person and um, maybe, you know... Um, uh, have a conversation with them. You know, it, it might be something that really does need attention. Definitely. Mm. And speaking of the blocking things out, politicians yes. and, and mindfulness. There's, there's been a movement around the world of a lot of politicians, yeah. well, not a lot, but some starting to use mindfulness. Yeah. You've, you've worked with some of them in the UK, haven't you? Well, look, I, yeah, there's, in the UK, there's a, a group, an all-parliamentary uh, mindfulness movement. Uh, Chris Ruan uh, is an MP over there who's been one of the prime drivers, Jamie Bristow. So they've done a fantastic job of um, a lot of um, parliamentarians and allied staff learning about mindfulness. In the UK Parliament, they're probably taking the lead more than anywhere else in the world. And uh, I mean, I've um, been invited to um, to speak um, there to um, to the to the group when um, I've previously been there. But uh, if anybody's interested, to really go and have a look at, at the work they've been doing, and um, it's tremendous because I think we need a little bit more awareness. Uh, a little bit more connection, a little bit less reactivity, a mm. little bit less uh, unconscious bias. Uh, Might be a good thing in politics in could, general, right? It could I'd certainly be. like to see our politicians in Australia practicing a little bit of mindfulness. Even a few minutes of meditation before parliament time would probably right. be a pretty good addition. Well, well, this is pretty much the executive functioning of the uh, society, and uh, we'd want to really help mindfulness to allow that to kick in. Yeah. <laughs> 
question is about the recent influx of mindfulness into the West. And actually, yeah. this is something I was asked yesterday. I was giving a keynote and someone asked me a question at the end. Why do you think mindfulness has become so popular? And I'll put, probably put it down to two things. The, the just overwhelming amount of evidence and research around it now, you know, mm. thousands of yes. studies a year. And of course, the neuroscience and being able to see what happens in the brain when mm. we practice mm. it. But also, I think we really need it. It's we're just in a, well, yeah, we're just, we're just in a fast-paced, yeah. distracted society with digital technology, and I think more and more we need an antidote to that. And I think that's mm. probably one of the main reasons it's become so popular. Yeah, and the antidote is not just a personal one for an individual, um, you know, in a dysfunctional society. Um, it's really about, uh, ultimately, a collective thing. Within an organisation, within a society, is to have a critical mass of people who are cultivating mm. mindfulness. Yeah so that we don't feel like we're swim swimming against the stream the whole time. We want to be sort of swimming in the, the same direction to being more aware and, and present. And being the change, yeah. as they say. Yeah. Now, a lot of interesting stuff uh, coming up on ethics and um, values this yep. week, and uh, uh, a number of learners um, noting how it could be so useful to just take a pause mm. before making a decision, before reflecting on an issue. Because it really does help to bring in that greater awareness and discernment about which thoughts are distraction or avoidance, which um, thoughts might be relevant uh, to just sort of get in touch with the emotional responses and so on. So it can be very helpful to start by stopping. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. And just to become aware, as you said, of what's going on in us, the emotions, the thoughts, mm. the cognitive biases, as you mentioned before, mm. but also to get in touch and listen to perhaps what our values are and how they might guide us to make certain decisions. And great to see that uh, some learners are quoting Shakespeare about being true to themselves. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you st you've certainly started something there, I think. Well, I didn't yeah. start. I think uh, Shakespeare started something a few hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting as well how some learners have noticed that when they're not aligned with their values or their ethics and they make a decision or they act, there's, there's a discomfort. Yes. And I think that's very mm. perceptive. Yes. And we, we were talking just before about how, you know, uh, lie detector tests are basically stress response tests. It's basically mm. detecting yeah. a stress response in the body. And, and when we lie and, and, and act out of integrity, there, is, there are subtle signals that, that mm. if we're paying attention to, we can start to notice them. And that can be very useful. Yes, that's right. So, and um, when we... When we're, uh, well, you we often have uh, conflicting goals. Somebody said, what happens if you've got two conflicting goals at the same time? Uh, that person's an uh, absolute um, Zen master. If they've only got two conflicting goals at the same time, yeah, most, right. most of us might have a, a dozen or 20 or 100, but um, seemingly conflicting goals. And we feel tugged in various um, directions. And, it, and it, to know what to go to and what to leave alone is not always that easy, what's driving us. But... The mindful response uh, will tend to be one that leads to a kind of an unburdening. I had a colleague at work um, who recently decided to leave the job, He'd been in for many years and, uh, and so on. And, uh, you know, things changed, made a decision to leave and asked her, well, how do you feel about that? She said, oh, I feel great. I feel great. And it was clearly, yeah. and there was a kind of a it wasn't, rest. It wasn't just avoidance. It wasn't just trying to get no. away from difficult situations. No. It was actually just coming into alignment with herself. Yeah, she'd made a, a considered uh, decision with all things going on in her life, and that was the right choice. There was part of her that would have liked to have kept going with this project and that, but uh, the decision to leave, and there was an unburdening. The mind was settled. There was a kind of a, a calm, a clarity about it. Yeah. Um, and now that, for me, has got the hallmarks of a mindful decision. Uh, it would make a decision to do something and but we've still got a whole lot of attachments we haven't let go of and so on and and if it's not the right decision very often there's a residual agitation in the mind uh, there's a lot of tension and um something unresolved that perhaps needs to be looked at yeah mm. yes so um there was a question as well about uh, can it be used to justify bad or mm. unethical behavior etc mindfulness yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> That's, uh, the mind gets very good at trying to justify all sorts of things, but that's not mindfulness. <laughs> no. So if we, that, you see, and a lot of that's really the default circuits going over time, yeah. you know, justifying, criticising somebody else, and, um, uh, and that is a really good sign that there's something not very mindful happening um, and not paying attention perhaps to the, <clears throat> to the effects of the decision we've made, that hurtful thing that was uh, said or done, and to not actually be paying attention, to be aware of the impact that it has on others. Because if we really stopped and looked, we'd probably yeah. 
actually feel some yeah. compassion and um, that's right. And mindfulness is ultimately about connection, isn't it, with mm. ourselves, yeah. with our senses, and with others. And, yeah. and if, we're, if we're genuinely connected with ourselves and our values and connected with others and aware of that interdependence, of course, we, we just act more ethically and we can't keep acting in the same unethical ways. Yes. Yeah. And in a way, that's, that's also mm. coming to the meditation, the choiceless awareness. That's yeah. really the value of doing that. You know, it, when we start practicing mindfulness, we, we, we cultivate concentration, don't we? You know, the ability to focus on one thing. Maybe it's the breath. Maybe it's, it's informal mm. activities. But after a while, we, we become able to rest the attention on the senses, on the body, mm. and at the same time to be aware of what's going through the mind, what's happening in, in the emotions, and what's, ha what's happening around us. So we just stay more present. And rather than being focused on any particular thing, we can just be aware of these things happening and, and fluidly move our attention between them. Yes. And I think that, that that means that we don't then start to ignore things that are happening around us, but we actually just become more and more present. And that's really the value of this meditation. Yeah, and it's in some ways it's more challenging. It seems like it's simpler, and perhaps it is, but it's it's actually more challenging. The the rock and sand metaphor, which a lot of wisdom traditions have used in one form or another, they're sort of the 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 solid, steady level of our being, the awareness, the simple observer, that that consciousness, just noticing, and then the shifting sand, all of the moving experiences and sensations and thoughts and so on, and they're constantly changing. And it's not like it's right or wrong; it's just how it is. And and that sort of practice makes that the transience of moment by moment experience quite apparent. But at the same time, what sort of starts to to sort of emerge is this sort of sense that there's something quite stable at the core of our being. And that contacting that can be a tremendously stabilizing thing in yeah. times of change or it would, you know, in our lives, etc. to actually have that to work from can be enormously stabilizing. Yeah. Mm. And of course then we can bring that into our everyday activities, which yeah. a lot of our learners were doing. Just yeah. eating more mindfully, moving more mindfully. Yeah, yeah. A tremendous and uh um uh, and you see, these simple moments in our day-to-day -day life, even if it's washing the dishes, can just be an opportunity for space in our day, um, just to give ourselves a bit of yeah. mental rest. And and often we're not paying attention to those things. No. We're, we're washing the dishes and worrying. We're walking and ruminating and yeah. uh, on an unconscious level. So to bring awareness to mundane activities gives us mental space, but it also yeah. helps to cultivate the state of mind to take into the next activity. Yeah ready to engage. Yeah, and if we're doing a chore and feeling frustrated, there's a pretty high likelihood our attention's not just on the activity that we're no. doing. It's already in the future or it's caught up in those judgments about doing it and mm. to, to perhaps notice that and come back to the senses yeah. is a pretty useful thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's just about it from us. We'd like to thank again our mentors and everybody behind the scenes who's helped put the course together. And we'd also like to reiterate that it's the end of this course, but certainly not the end of this journey of mindfulness. No. I mean, we've really just planted seeds, haven't we? Four weeks is a very short amount of time mm. to be learning mindfulness and embedding it into our lives, particularly if this is the first course that some of our learners have done. But it's really just about, you know, uh, getting, getting us started. And, 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 and of course, we need to keep practicing and applying these things in our lives so that we can keep, be uh, keep benefiting from them. Um, so we'd encourage our learners to perhaps consider doing some of our other courses. This course will run again in June. We have our sort of part one course, Mindfulness yeah. for Wellbeing and Peak Performance, starting on May the 7th, and um, people can enrol in that now. Mm. Yeah, in fact, if um, you did this course first without having done the introductory one, it would be very good to go back and do that course now. Yeah. Mm. We'd also uh, encourage you perhaps to upgrade the course so that you have access to the materials forever. Uh, that, that might be something useful. Mm -hmm. And also, if, if you enjoyed doing this course, please review it. Um, we, we'll provide some links for different places that, that you can review it. Let other people in your life know how useful it's been and encourage them to do it with you or to do it themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that's been, it's been great. Thanks yeah. for all of your sharing. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the, the, the really insightful comments that you've made, and particularly for supporting one another online. Mm. And um, we look forward to seeing you another time. Yes, and to quote Shakespeare, if I may. <laughs> you may. Our revels now are ended, and if we go to the end of that speech, and, and uh, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded in a sleep. So uh, practice mindfulness and wake up. Ah, uh, shaky. <laughs>